Raise taxes to encourage economic growth. Yes, you heard it here. Your old buddy Josh. I'm going full Bernie Sanders. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just, it's a good headline because hopefully it'll get uh, people like, what? What's this guy talking about? I am going to take on some of the fallacies of basic economics. So, oh, it's so, it's so frustrating. So I get, you know, I, I subscribe. I'm a, a member of the Mises Institute, or as crazy Austrian economist. Um, the anarcho-capitalist, which I, uh, I gotta, can't get rid of this thing right here. It's driving me crazy. Um, which I, <laughs> whatever. Um, it, it, anarchy sounds great in paper. In reality, it's, it's always doomed to fail. All right. Anyway, socialism, always doomed to fail. Communism, doomed to fail. Anarchy is always doomed to fail. No other way around that. So we need to have some sort of socialistic capitalism is kind of what we have in america dude i mean it's you can even say it's fascistic in some regard well it's actually absolutely fascistic but we got to get over this thing like oh my goodness my way is the only way i got proof of this and yeah so i get the austrian uh and this is the most recent austrian magazine and uh i they're interviewing um right here my man edward chancellor who had written a book uh, the time of, what is it called? What's this book called? The Price of Time. And uh, he's talking about, you know, uh, in a way, the definition of usury is an interest rate. It's actually uh, rather subjective. It's what an individual feels is an unfair rate of interest. And that's, I, cause I'm, I'm starting to get very not so keen on usury. Now, what exactly is usury? You'd have to think about that. It goes to the Bible, though. You don't charge interest to your own people. The Israelites don't charge interest to the Israelites. You know what I'm saying? You charge interest to foreigners, but not your own people. I mean, it's biblical stuff here, man. Usury is, uh, is you know, I'm, I'm against it. All the way to it. Now, does that mean I don't invest in like a bond or a CD? No, not necessarily. I'm still kind of chomping on that a little bit too, because CDs are interest that they're charging somebody. And I look, just in my head, I'm just thinking this through and I'm kind of sharing with you out loud because it helps me kind of verbalize my thinking. Anyway, so uh, Chancellor had written a book about the, uh, uh, something about, yeah, the uh, Devil Take the Hindmast, A History of Financial Speculation. Uh, that's uh, Charles McKay, I think is his name, talking about the, you know, the, the, uh, the, tool, the, the toolish, toolish, the tulip bubble. It was a Dutch tulip bubble? I can't remember. Back from the 1700s, whatnot, uh, Newton said, uh, you know, I can understand the motions of the worlds. Can you? They're big, Isaac, can you? Uh, but I don't know the mindset of speculators. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Newton. Mm, okay. Anyway, so I'm reading the, a little bit of this, and I come across this article, uh, this thought right here. Our senior fellow David Gordon is back with a review of Arthur Laffler's book, Ta Laffer's book, Taxes Have Consequence, an income tax of the history of the United States. So that sounds interesting to me. I like Laffler, Laffer, and I like uh, taxes. So I said, so I started looking up on Amazon and I come across a description. From ever since 1930, when the U.S. first imposed the income tax, the top rate of that tax has determined the fate of the American economy. <laughs> Oh, I mean, the top rate of the tax has determined the fate of the American economy. What? Are these people so just reading their own headlines? Like what the rich people pay determines what the, the I mean, we're talking as AOC said, the tippy top, what they pay in income tax determines the fate of the American economy. Oh, I think it, but it gets worse. And this is just the, the I'm not going to buy this book now because this is if this is the description. I want to jump off a bridge uh, into a freaking a, uh, a swamp of starving great whites after I slice up myself and bleeding all over the place. Aye. When the top rate has been high, as in the late eight, 1910s, huh, what was going on in the late 1910s? The 1930s, huh? the 1940s, huh? 1950s and the 70s. The response of those with money and capital has been to curtail real economic activity in favor of protecting assets and income streams. What? When the top rate has been high as in the late 1910s, we're friggin' fighting a stupid war that Woodrow Wilson put us in after he said he wasn't going to put us in there, Art Laffler. You know this. The 1930s was the Great Depression. And he's going to blame it on income tax rates. Huh? 
It's freaking idiotic. 1940s, another war. I've never once heard anyone say anything bad about the 50s, but okay, there we go. In the 1970s, huh? You're going to blame the economic uh, inflate. So you're going to blame high tax rates for the depression in the 1930s and the inflation in the 1970s. Huh? <laughs> and the rich are going to hide their economics. They're, they're going to hide those with money and capital, but will curtail real economic activity in favor of protecting their assets and income streams. That, what? Well, well, we don't, we don't want to invest because we get hit harder from an income tax perspective. That makes no sense, Art. We invest for capital appreciation, not from an income appreciation. This is freaking idiotic. Oh, but you get income off your investments if they ever matriculate. The idea that people are not going to invest or they're going to hide their assets or cur curtail their assets because high income taxes is stupid. Now, there's a simple way around this, I'll tell you, and I'll share with you what it is right quick. But it's just, it's idiot. I'm like, what? Some of these guys, they get lucky. The Laffer curve, you know what I'm saying? That's what Reagan, you know, said, reduce the tax rates, you actually have more economic activity. And that happened to be right under Reagan. That's what happened. Is that a coincidence or is a correlation equals causation? I don't know. But be honest, we'll keep reading. Huge declines have come to the economy in these circumstances with high taxes. For the upper, upper, upper. And I'm going to show you why it's silly here in a second. The most brutal example was the Great Depression. When the top tax rate had been cut. Uh, we'll go into this here. When the top tax rate has been cut and held at reduced levels at the, as in the 20s and the 60s. The long boom of the 80s and 90s. And briefly, in the, this is just like what happens with these. Um, so there's a guy who was shot in Utah, I think, five miles away. I can't, off the top of my, I can't remember. And uh, it basically, so everyone's like, oh my God, it's the best shot. He got lucky. Uh, now, it's interesting because I know a guy said, did you take into consideration the Coriolis effect? And he goes, no, but I'm not a flat earther. This is weird. I said, well, you didn't take into consideration the Coriolis effect. We had, somehow the earth is still spinning and you're supposed to take that into consideration when you're firing something that far away. Uh, that's kind of weird. Or it's supposed to go over a curve that didn't happen. It's kind of weird too. Anyway, be that way. So what happens is you take this thing, and this is what art is doing. And, and all economists worldwide do this. And if I can find my pen here, here we go. So you take, you have all these you know, shots. You're shooting, 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 and then you hit one, and then you draw your target around that shot. All right, that's what happens here. It's no different than the guy in Utah. Look, I I, I could never shoot something like that, but it's a it was, it was on a 69th try. So he had 69 tries. <laughs> Let me get this one. 69 different tries. And finally, he hits it. And th these guys didn't say it. I'm just, this is what we say. You're drawing a target around where you actually, where your bullet landed to prove your validity. And that's what Arthur is, Art Laff, Laffer is doing here. It's embarrassingly silly. And it's, uh, it's, it's I hate to say infantile, but I All right. The huge swings in the American economy had an inverse relationship to the income tax rate. Okay, so let, let's talk about this for a second. So I want to go to something here real quick, if I can find it. All right, so here's a 100-year history of the U.S. federal taxes from the Tax Foundation. And these people here at, uh, I can't tell what that, they, they gave it to a gra graphical pr perspective adjusted for inflation. All right, so here is your income. If So here you can, let me just. I gotta make this bigger one second. So here's the huge tax increases to fund the World War One. Here's the huge tax increases to fund World War Two. All right, so you can say, oh my goodness, that's why the economic activity st stagnated. I mean, it's just it's so idiotic to say the huge tax increases led to economic stagnation or ec economic collapse. It's just freaking stupid. I, I I hate that because it's so infantile. Art knows this, but yet I don't. I don't understand it. And maybe people don't think. That's the only thing I can think. Anyway, all right. So what happened here? Fund the war. Fund the war. And then the 1970s, right? Whoa! Wait, what? 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 Art taxes were going down from a 90 percent to freaking 70 percent, and that's a pretty significant tax decrease. But it doesn't even matter because this is the rich people at a million bucks in 2011 numbers or whatever. Here is the. Uh, a hundred thousand. All right. So here, if you had a hundred thousand bucks, you didn't really, you paid ten ten thousand dollars ten percent up until World War uh, II, and then you're sitting about thirty percent. 
and then you can see you see what i'm saying so basically and here if you're in the bottom echelons you didn't really pay anything until world war ii and then it just kind of stuck but you're still sitting about 15 to 20 percent all right but now that's not enough though. i want to show you because i mean so in of itself this disproves art right and in, 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 inherently i mean look at this we had tax declines wait when did the great depression start art did it start in 1931 no we know economic activity dis declines significantly. Wait, can I show you? Just use a gauge of economic activity, economic uh, inflation as a gauge of economic activity. In 1926, 1.1. 1 .1. 1927, negative. 1928, negative. 1929, zero. 1930, negative. 1931, negative 9%. 1932, negative 10. So you could say, well, look, Josh, when they raised taxes, we had a significant deflation. Uh, the deflation was already there, Art. <laughs> Sometimes, like, do people actually just think before they write? So we have tax decreases going from these years, not massive in, uh, economic growth. That's a fact, Jack. And yet, look at this. You know, tax decreases and uh, inflation is low. And then we have deflation from right here when the tax rates are going down. And massive deflation in 1930. Now you can say, well, 1931 that led to massive deflation. When the ta did the ta they start pulling money out? I mean, just <laughs> jeez, man. I just downloaded the stuff from the Tax Foundation, the Federal Income Tax Rates History, and you notice they have the rates per income. All right, so we're going to look at let's hold on a sec. We're going to look at the uh, Federal Income Tax History going back to 1913, which is the advent of the income tax. And the Federal Reserve Board. All right. So what we're going to... And I think was the income tax at Federal Reserve Board. What else? 1913, the Federal Reserve Board was inaugurated. The FBI was inaugurated. The IRS was inaugurated. And the ADL, <laughs> Anti-Defamation League, was inaugurated. Oh, it was bad, I should say. How funny is that? Classic. All right. I don't know why I can't make this... I try to freeze these columns. I'm in... Uh, we're in Apple Sheets or whatever, and I can't, for some reason, it doesn't freeze the, these, uh, right, not the columns, these rows. I don't get it. I just literally, I said freeze the rows, and it didn't freeze the rows. So if any of you know why I'm doing wrong, let me know, because I said like this, and I said freeze rows, says freeze header rows right there, but it doesn't do it. Why? Why doesn't it do it? Why, why can't I do it? All right, so in 2021, you'll see married finally jointly. You're in a 22% tax bracket if you have anything above 81000 That's before standard deductions. Just keep that in mind as we talked about yesterday. Uh, same thing, you know, single. Here you go. All right, so this is, you know, we'll essentially say that's the median right there because that's essentially what the median household income is. So if you're below the median, your, your tax consequence is 10, 12, and 22% essentially. All right. If you're above the median, your tax consequence is 24 and up. Hmm. Median 50% have more, 50% of the people have less. All right. So we're going to go down to 19, that was 2020. Now let's go all the way down. We'll start with, I don't know, say the day, the year I was born. All right. So here we go. And we have lots of different tax brackets. It's almost like the uh, estate, oh, the gift tax stuff. If you look at this and the estate stuff, very interesting. All right, so what was, and this is in that year's dollars, nominal dollars, nominal means, means at that time. What was the median income in 1970? Let's take a gander. The median family income in 1970 was 9,800 bucks. Wow. We'll just say 10,000 bucks for simplicity. And we'll come over here. 10,000 bucks was the median income. And so again, you're right there. You're paying about 22%. There you go. 22%. Just like we're paying now. Amazing. That's nuts. I don't know, let's go down to the oh, 1960. Was a median income in 19 uh, medium tax rate in 1960. 1960, the median income was 5,600 bucks. All right, so let's go back to this guy. 5,600 bucks, and you were paying 22 percent. Oh. <laughs> it's almost identical what we're paying now. Uh, last law to change race was the IRC in 1954. All right. So now let's go down the meet. It goes back as far as 1953 is that median income thing. So right here. So 22%. There you go. So, I mean, I, and I'm not saying what the standard member, this is before standard deductions, before personal exemptions. I do not know what those were back then. I'm just using this as taxable income. So again, watch the video I did yesterday, the difference between taxable income 
and AGI. AGI is what you made before your standard deductions and before your exemptions. And then if you get, uh, if you get, uh, if you do uh, write-offs, if you itemize, it's before that as well. AGI is your top line, but your taxable income is how they tax you on your taxable income after standard deductions, after exemptions, after um, your itemizations. All right, let's keep going. All right, so 1953, the uh, median household income was 4,200 bucks. All right, so again, we're seeing as a median household income, it's always been about 22%. That's, and again, we're taking household income. I'm not even saying that's taxable income. You, I'm, I'm not, I just don't feel like getting that deep in the woods here, but you get the gist. I hope the difference between taxable income and AGI. So we're looking, this is just taxable income. So if there's this, I don't want to, let's take a look here. All right, so in 1964, all right, let's see. The 19, you're single in the bed to pay. Okay. In 1913 was when the Fed was created and the ADL, ADL, solely a small category of rich people had to pay the tax. After joining World War I, the government government uh, reduced the exemptions to cover war expenses. Thus, a single individual had to pay 1000 bucks, and married had to pay 2000 bucks. I guess that's if they, that was their standard deduction, I guess. Uh, at the end of the World War, the exemptions were raised in order to cut the number of taxpayers. However, during the Depression, the government had to make up the declined tax revenue and decide to reduce the amount of exemptions, but we still had uh, exemptions. During that time, the standard deduction was 10% of the income. All right, so if you're married, you had 10% of your income. You could deduct away from income tax. That's pretty significant. Uh, 1964, uh, we had a, ba a minimum standard deduction was nearly... Uh, 300 plus 100 dollars per exemption it allowed taxpayers to take a bigger minimum standard deduction on their percentage of standard uh, or this okay they allowed to take the bigger of the the greater of the minimum standard deduction or the percentage of standard deduction all right uh, 1970 my uh, date of birth brought mass inflation which began a reason of huge problems and Congress decided to increase the standard deduction from 10 percent to 15 percent. In 1970, the standard deduction looked more similar to what we have today, 2000 for singles and 3200 for married couples. So the standard deduction was 3200 bucks if you're married. If we go back to this chart, 1970, the average household, the median household was 90 was basically 10000 bucks. So you're able to write off freaking 15 to 30% of that depending on if you're married or not. It's crazy. Crazy. And yet art is going to tell us, "But look, Josh, look." Not <sighs> Remember when art was griping about high taxes in the 50s leading to low growth? Let's take a look. What? 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 Here's GDP growth rate. <laughs> I mean, 8.7844 negative in 1954. Was that the year of a, a influenza pandemic? I think it might have been. Seven, two. Like, no one has ever said the 1950s were low growth. I don't know. I literally don't understand what art is talking about here. When he says, uh, when the top rate has been high, the response of those with money has been to curtail real, real economic activity in, in favor of protecting assets and income streams. Huge declines have come to the economy. I mean, this is, I just, oh, good night, man. I don't understand. And then he says, well, in the 60s, we had tax cuts and we had economic growth, but, okay, but... <laughs> Whatever, I can't take it. The 70s, we had economic growth too. There are, we had one negative year. I mean, these are GDP growth, growth rates. We're a recession in the 73, 70, 73, 70, well, I guess 74, 75, but these weren't negative growth rates, positive, but they're inflationary. See, that's what I'm saying. You can't have your, you, you can't get both sides of this coin, man. Anyway, so raise taxes, increase growth, huh? That's, that's what we can learn from here. Yeah. Anyway. I just, uh, I think we need to, what we need to start doing is taxing wealth and not income. Don't tax labor, tax wealth. That's what we, that's the way we should do this now. We should say, look, we need to incentivize people to work. If we're taxing work, we're not going to incentivize people to work. We don't have enough workers. Thus, we need people to do so. And the way we get them is to decentivize them from sitting on their butts and incentivize them to get out there and push a shovel. All right. And then we need to say, but Josh, if you tax wealth, then people would hide their assets and not do anything with it. How would they do that? They'll take it to other places. Really? Where? 
Monte Carlo, uh, I don't know, freaking Switzerland. I mean, some you think they're not already doing that? <laughs> hey, come on, man. Come on, man. Let me sniff some hair. All right, love your thoughts. We'll see you.